Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology webinar hosted by Texas Instruments. For tonight, we're going to take a look at how you can identify some classroom needs before you write your grant. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. Joining us tonight is Jennifer Cesar and Doris Teague. Jen is a grant partnership consultant for Texas Instruments. And before coming to Texas Instruments, she taught middle grades, math, and science for Carlton Farms Branch ISD. Jen also taught science, health, and special ed for Grants Cibola County Schools. Jen was the Curriculum Development Manager for the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, where she and her team created the content used in the Space Camp and Aviation Challenge programs, as well as unique learning experiences at the Space and Rocket Center Museum. Jen, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Uh, wonderful to be here and to see so many participants online. I hope we have a great session and that you get a lot of useful information. And Doris has experience in the development and implementation of gear programs in Texas, past experience as a teacher, supervisor, project coordinator, grant writer, and trainer. She is currently consulting with five gear partnerships and serves as a grants outreach consultant with Texas Instruments. Experience at local, state, and national venues including the National Center for Community and Educational Partnerships, gives Doris a broad knowledge of education initiatives and practices. Doris, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, it's good to be here. Welcome everyone. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free at any time to send any questions that you have for Jen or Doris using the Q&A window on the right side of your screen. We'll also be using the chat window to send general messages. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar, along with the documents that both Jen and Doris are gonna be using tonight. We hope you don't have any audio issues tonight, but if you do, Find your name in the participant window. In that window, you'll look for an icon. That looks like a phone. And if you click on that phone icon, you'll get call-in information to call in using your phone, and that should uh, alleviate any further audio issues. At this point, Jen is going to discuss our agenda. So good evening. Uh, tonight what we're talking about is a continuation from a session that we had in December, and we're looking at the statement of need portion of any grant proposal. Uh, today our navigation points go are going to include uh, making sure that you have a shared vision with the funder that you're trying to do and that your project also shares a vision uh, with what your organization does. Uh, we're going to look at how you go about defining the need that you're trying to get funded, uh, what research you need to have um, in order to support uh, that request, uh, where you can find the data, and how to tell a compelling story. Uh, we also have online resources, uh, so the PowerPoint that uh, we're going to be using tonight uh, is available in this Dropbox along with um, sample statements of needs uh, and the materials from session one. Uh, and then, of course, we have a link there for additional um, research and funding opportunities um, available there at TI. Thanks so much. We also want to mention that uh, stick around to the end uh, because you're automatically, by attending tonight, automatically entered for a drawing for a registration uh, for two to the T-Cubed International Conference coming up in March in San Antonio. And Jen, will you also mind discussing some of our expected outcomes for tonight? Not a problem. At, at the end of this session, 
our expectation is that you will hopefully understand the connection between your vision and the funders, um, because making that connection is going to make finding funding for your projects that much easier. Uh, we also uh, expect that you will know the four components to defining your need statement and that you will understand the types of research that are necessary for supporting uh, your need statement. And of course, the last thing is that you'll know how to go find that data. All right, Jen, thanks so much. You have control, feel free to share your screen. Okay, so here we go. Uh, So today we're going to be talking about communicating your vision, which is essentially creating a convincing statement of need. Um, that statement of need is where you're telling the funder uh, what it is you need and why you need it, and providing them with the background information that's necessary for them to recognize that you actually understand what that need really is. Uh, let's go on. So as we go through, what we're going to be looking at is, of course, that shared vision. Uh, then we're going to get into defining the need. And then we're going to talk about the different types of research that are required and where you find those data sources. And then, of course, lastly, telling a compelling story. So shared vision. Uh, what you're trying to do with a shared vision is create a collaborative, global view that a funder uh, can and wants to support. Um, you want to make sure that you're not confusing your organization's needs with the statement of needs versus the target population that you're trying to serve. So if your school needs something, that's actually different than if your students need something. And funders don't fund typically what the school might need, but they will fund what you need for that target population. Uh, the other thing is not to forget when you're creating that statement of need um, to show that funder the impact to the community or the region uh, that what you're trying to do uh, is going to, to impact. So looking at that, you know, do your vision align? So we're actually going to go out to our web and I'm going to Trying to see if I can make this. Can it, I don't know if you can read it or not, so I'm going to try to make it a little bigger. Set it. So in case uh, you're having a little bit trouble seeing Jen's screen, I think it definitely is a little bigger now. But there's also in the the window where Jen's sharing her screen, in the upper right-hand corner, there's like a little two-arrow maximize. And so you could actually maximize that window if you're having uh, any trouble seeing her screen. Thank you. Okay, so on this screen, what, what we're looking at is this is Flory Primary School. Uh, I actually think it's a school in Australia. Uh, the school itself has a vision and a mission statement. Now, most of you, at your school, your school or your district has a vision statement for the school. Uh, in this case, their vision is they're going to empower students to acquire, demonstrate, articulate, and value knowledge and skills that, gonna, that are going to support them as lifelong learners and to participate and contribute to the global world and practice the core values of school respect, tolerance, and inclusion and excellence. Uh, and then you have their mission statement. And their mission statement tells them how they're going to achieve that vision. So this is important because when you are writing your statement of need, if your school has a particular vision of what you're trying to do and a particular mission of how you go about it and what you're trying to write for your grant is contrary to that mission, a funder is going to look at that and, and and wonder how you're going to be successful 
when you're going against the flow of what your school is trying to do. So when you think about the projects you want to do, you also need to think about how what you're trying to do fits in with the overall mission and vision of your school. So that's the first place when you're creating that vision and mission for your project, uh, you need to make sure that you are in line with your school goal. That's also important in that statement of need in garnering the support from your administrator um, and the district support personnel that you may need uh, for especially larger grants. Uh, small grants that are in that one to $2,000 range, you may not necessarily need that because the grant may be awarded to you as an individual. But a grant awarded to your school, that grant has got to be in alignment with it. Uh, but in addition, uh, you also have to make sure that you're aligned um, in terms of the goal. Well, let's, I want to look at goals here. So here's a way that the, your proposal itself expresses what its goals are. So this would be part of it. In this case, they're stating it separately. This is gear up in um, uh, Socorro ISD, and they're part of the UTEP grant. Uh, they have a vision statement that all gear up participants will successfully complete high school and pursue a post-secondary education. And then in their mission statement, they state exactly how they're going to do it. This mission, vision and mission statement were pulled from the actual statement of need for this grant. So, when you're thinking about that statement of need, this is the most concise way you can identify exactly what your, what your goal is and how you're going to get there. Um, so you want to be uh, very clear. In this case, their goals, the way they're going to meet that vision statement is by increasing high school graduation and college attendance rates of low-income kids. Uh, they were going to increase the academic performance of low-income students, and then they were going to enhance uh, school academic and curricular reforms that included professional development for the teachers. So that's the, those are the goals. They haven't stated the specifics and the details of how they're going to do that because that falls under the solution. Your need statements is all about the problem you're trying to solve. We're going to go back here. And lastly, you also want to look at what is what the funds are trying to do. What do they fund? Uh, is what you're trying to do going to fit with the funder that you're seeking? Is what you're trying to do something that you can adjust for fit? So maybe you're not perfectly aligned in what you want to do, but you can tweak what it is you're trying to do to fit what the funder wants to fund. So we're going to take a look at that for a funder. Okay, so this is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they do a lot of K-12 funding. Uh, but what's their vision? Their vision is that all lives have equal value, and they're impatient optimists working to reduce uh, inequality. And they typically like to look in particular areas that uh, young people survive and thrive. So you'll notice you see health and education there. That's one part of their vision. They believe that's one aspect of how they go about that. And then they talk about more specifics. So the mission statements are stated under this, these little headings called a closer look. So uh, they fund in education uh, enhancements that are driven by innovation. And they also look at nutrition, healthy mothers, and then they have a specific project that they're working on in their home state of Washington. They look to empower people, uh, particularly women and girls, uh, because the bulk of people in the poverty line tend to be women and women with children. So here, their, their mission is to provide poor with access to financial tools, teach farmers how to increase. Uh, productivity in a sustainable way uh, to help women make informed family planning and to increase student college completion rates. And then, of course, they go on with that with the health component. So, if they had a grant that was being offered in this health component, uh, and you're a K-12 facility, 
this is probably not going to be a good fit for you unless your proposal was about health screenings at the beginning of the school year for low-income students. Um, if you're trying to get technology for your classroom, this would not be a good fit. So that's, you want to see what it is they're trying to fund, um, what direction they take that funding to make sure that you fit. It's going to save you a lot of time and effort and a lot of headache if you're aware of what they fund and aware of uh, how they see that in the world place because using their language in describing what you're trying to do is going to make them sit up and notice your proposal over somebody else. Okay, so looking at defining the need, uh, I went kind of fun. Uh, obviously, if you're paying attention to the slides, we've got all different kinds of star uh, and space things going on here. So, uh, you know, if we were uh, a smaller group, I'd have people tell me what kinds of uh, different movies I've got going on here. But this was a fun way to break down how you look at what your need actually is and how you define it. So the first thing is, is that whenever you're doing a statement of need, there are four components to it. The first component is what that initial condition is. What is it that raised its head, shot off the flags, and said, hey, this is the problem? And then what's your goal? What are you trying to do in relation to that problem? And then, of course, the third one is what resources do you already have available? And what are the constraints that keep that would keep you from meeting that goal? Because in order to deal with your with what it is you need, you need to be aware of both. Um, and then of course ownership. Whose problem is this? And who's best qualified to solve the problem? You know, and how do you know it's a problem? Your statement of need needs to be supported by evidence. Uh, and that type of evidence is going to be qualitative or quantitative. And obviously, of course, the data needs to be current. But let's look at this particular problem. Uh, in this case, I gave you a problem where you're leaving Moss Eisley and you need to travel to the Rebel base on Hoth with a, your R2-D2 unit, a Jawa, and Jawa the Hutt's Rancor. Now, your X-Wing fighter can only carry you and one passenger at a time. Now, here, we also know that R2-D2 and the Jawa uh, can't be left alone together um, because the Jawa will take them apart, sell off the parts. But you can't leave the Jawa with the Rancor because the Rancor is going to eat him. So the only thing uh, where you could pair them up would be the Rancor doesn't eat droids, so that might be a safe pairing. So this is what we know about this particular situation. So when we look at conditions one through four, what, how would that break down? So let's take a look at that. In the initial situation, what you have is you, a Rancor, R2-D2, a Jawa, a Moss Eisley with your X-Wing fighter. And you need to... The goal is to get everybody over to Hoth. So what are your resources? In this particular case, you have an X-Wing fighter, and then you're left with your knowledge and problem-solving skills related to the items that you need to transport. What are the constraints? You can only take one passenger at a time. You can't leave the Rancor with the Jawa or the Jawa with the R2-D2. Of course, obviously, the goal is to get to Hoff, and then the ownership, you're involved in planning the solution and then carrying it out. Now, that's a little spacey and it's a little fun, and I, I'm sure everybody's familiar with the, the old how do you get the cannibal across the river um, problem-solving uh, problem activity, and that's where this comes from, but it actually helps you to break down defining the need from an educational standpoint for your grant. So here's example two. Your students are underperforming on the state math exam. The tests show that the main areas of weakness are mathematics modeling, 
uh, and graphing equation. The students are performing at 46%, which is 15 points lower than the state. Your district is urban, and your school has 78% of students listed as free and reduced lunch. Now, according to the Census Bureau, approximately two out of every 10 households has access to a home computer. So it's not very many. Um, and your school only has a computer lab with 30 computers. So that's not a lot of computers for your students. Uh, your classroom supply and technology budget for the school year is about 100 bucks. And then the next largest district in your state, which has similar demographics, um, has managed to raise their scores. And they did that by investing in graphing technology for each classroom, professional development for the teachers, and software that students could access before and after school. And you're not alone in this problem. Your department and your administration team are on board with making whatever changes you can figure out that are going to resolve this issue. So let's break it down into those components. We're looking at basically these questions. What's the initial situation? What are the resources that we have? What are the constraints? What's our goal? And who's taking ownership? So looking at the initial situation in this new example that's more in tune with, of course, what we're trying to do, the initial situation is your students are not meeting the expectations on the state math exam. And you have particular target areas, mathematic modeling, graphing equations. So what resources do you have? You have a computer lab that has 30 computers. You have a $100 supply. Uh, you have access to testing data and demographic data for your district. Uh, you have a, a district that is comparable to your district where they've actually implemented a solution that's been successful. Uh, and you have the support of the teachers in your department, your district curriculum personnel, and your school administration. Okay, so what are your constraints? You have a computer lab, but it only has 30 computers. You only have $100. Uh, your students have limited access to technology outside of school. So what's your goal? Now, you might think the goal would be uh, increase the technology or get graphing calculators because that's what works in the other school. So we're going to go out and buy graphing calculators, and we're going to have professional development. Okay, those are two wonderful things, but that's not the goal. The goal isn't, those are tools. You can have all the tools to build a house, but it's not going to build the house. It's not going to fix the problem of needing a house. Tools don't do the work. They're just part of what does the work. So in this case, we want to raise student test scores on that main uh, state math exam and increase their knowledge and skills in mathematic modeling and graphing equations. Graphing calculators will be a part of the solution. Professional development will be a part of the solution, but it's only a part. What else are you going to do educationally to help address those needs is all going to be part of the solution that you're going to do. Then you have ownership. So who's the owner? Who's going to take care of this problem? It's not just going to be you. It will be you. You have department team members that are working with you. You've got district personnel and district administration, all that's on board to help you with this problem. Okay, so, you know, I've got danger, danger, Will Robinson. Part of the issue here is one of the things, and I just kind of mentioned it a little bit, talking about graphing technology. One of the biggest problems that grant funders see in a, in a grant proposal is that the proposer has used circular reasoning. Uh, so essentially how that looks is uh, they state the absence of the solution as being the problem. And an example in this case would be uh, 
we have no senior uh, center in our community, so if we build a senior center, that solves the problem. Okay. But that's circular, that's circular logic. It isn't the problem. Uh, in the case of technology for your classroom, the technology is a means to an end, so the absence of it is not the problem. It's what you're going to do with it educationally that you can't do without it. That's the problem you're trying to address. So be very careful when you're making your statement of need that you focus on what the actual problem really is. Doris, do you have anything you would like to add to? Because I know you've got a lot of thoughts on this. Well, you know what? It's, this is very clearly uh, stated, and and I just want to say that, like, it, when you start looking for grants in, in classrooms, you're probably not going to find a whole lot that come up with the identical um, with the identical solution you're looking for. So you may find some grants, and they may fund certain things, but you have to you would have to finesse the wording and the information in it um, so that it it matches the needs that you have. Uh, I'm not trying to make it more complicated, but there's just not very many grants that are written that say, you know, we're going to help you with math modeling right now. So you have, to, you have to be sure that you're identifying that need out there. The need is for the students to um, be successful on the state assessment. And so uh, you'll need to look for grants along those lines, you know, that improve student success, that uh, improve their math skills, that um, are aligned to the curriculum, so those kinds of things. And when you're looking for grants and, and grants that satisfy your needs. Thank you. Uh, Mike, do we have any questions so far? I haven't seen any come across, but uh, I'll let you know if we do. Okay, thank you. I like to pause every so often just in case I'm going too fast or uh, people have questions. So uh, if you have questions, please please put them in the, the Q&A or the chat, and Michael will let me know that they're there so that we can take a moment and address them. Okay, so research. Uh, research, of course, in any statement of need is going to be critical, um, and that research needs to be both qualitative and quantitative, and there's lots of different things that need to go into it. So, for example, uh, demographics. Who is the target audience uh, that you're actually uh, planning to serve? So you need to know about that target audience. Is it your low-income kids? Is it your high-performing kids that need gifted and talented? Uh, is it your general population of kids? Are you looking to do a pullout or an after-school program? So you need to know the demographics that you're trying to serve. You need to know about your organization. You need to know about uh, the program that your district already has in place or that your community has in place. Uh, for example, if you're trying to do a STEM program after school for kids. And there's already a very successful one that the target population you're looking at uh, can attend, then that's probably not a good fit unless you're looking to expand that exact program to additional locations. Um, so you want to have that information on hand. And there's a couple ways you can go about getting that. And then you want to have problem-related data. You know, what's the scope at both, the, at both the local and the state level in regards to your problem? Um, what are the trends? What's happening across your state, in your community? Uh, are there trends in how this is being solved? You also want to have information about solutions and best practices. Now, the thing on solutions and best practices is that while they will not go in to the statement of need, because that's a different section of the grant, you do need to have the research and data related to that so that when that section comes up, you're able to pull that data. And you also want to have it because it will be part of 
your overall goal. Some sources of data include things like surveys, needs assessments, uh, your local colleges or universities maintain data. Uh, regional planning and developmental councils will have lots of data. Uh, your local library is also a good source of data. Uh, here's the critical part. When you're including the data into your statement of need, you want to ensure that you're using comparative data. And I'll give you a good example. The poverty rate in Acme County is 15%. Okay, that's a statement. There's nothing to compare that to. We don't know if that's a good rate for that area or a bad rate for that area, somewhere middle of the road, because we're not, we don't have anything to compare it against. So the person who's reading it may not know that that's, you know, 15% poverty rate in a population of five. Um, is very different than 15% in a much larger population, or um, it might not be, depending on the area. So what you would want to do is present the data in this format. For example, using that same one, the poverty rate in Acme County is 15% compared with 12% in the state and 12.5% nation, nationwide. Now they can compare they have a, an ability to look at what your statement is compared to other locations. So it's very important because the person who's reviewing needs to get a clear view of what it is you're telling them. They don't live in your community unless it's a local grant. And most grants that you're going to apply for are not going to be right there uh, in your community. They're going to be grants that are funded from other sources that may be in a completely different state. And so they need a clear picture of what you're talking about. Hey, Jen. Mm -hmm. We had a question from Natash. Uh, they're wondering if grant submissions ever have a, a page number limit. Um, do you find that often or no? Uh, we find that very often, which is one of the reasons why you're going to collect all the data first, and once you have all the data, based on your page number, you start writing, and it's okay to exceed first, and then you're going to pare down so that you're falling within the page numbers. Um, but the more information you have about a problem or situation, um, the more concise you can be in, in how you state something. So, like the big long statement that I had for the need uh, on example two, let me back up. Okay, so this big long statement here, you could take that and shrink it up because you have enough information there to understand what's going on. And so you could find a shorter way to say the same thing without losing information which you can't do if you don't have enough data. So you will find those page constraints, and so you're going to, and they may even have specific things like a font size, the line spacing, the size of the margins. Um, we kind of covered that in session one, but anytime the funder gives you constraints in the actual proposal itself, Follow those to a T. If they tell you to chew bubble gum and hop on one foot while you're typing, get out the bubble gum and start hopping, okay? That, because what they'll do is if they tell you one inch margins and, they, and you turn it in and it's a little uh, uh, less than the one inch, the way they measure it is they slap a ruler down on it. And if you are less than the one inch, they don't look at yours. They put it into the reject pile right away. So that was Thank a good you. question. And I saw someone else had asked about um, sites to look for grants. That's also covered in the session one. And at the end of this, when you get the Dropbox link, uh, you can go in there and it's got a list of funding places that you can uh, find. 
Okay, so let's actually look at some research here. Uh, so some of the places where you can find data, uh, obviously the Census Bureau. So when you're looking for demographic data, you know, what, what, what are the um, uh, ethnic groups and, and what's the percentage of their makeup in your community? Uh, how many people have computers? How many people don't? How many people are employed? How many aren't? First place you can go to find most of that data is the Census Bureau. Um, other data that you can find, if you're looking for district-specific or school-specific, you could go to your district assessment office because they're going to have your testing data for your school. Or you could go to your State Department of Education um, to find solutions and what other people are doing uh, for best practices or the research about those um, best practices and solutions. You can find um, ones that have been vetted uh, at a national level at the What Works Clearinghouse. Uh, you're going to find all kinds of testing data at your State Department of Education. Uh, you'll also be able to find that comparative data between, say, your district and comparable districts at that State Department of Ed. Um, you'll also find research, uh, especially around TI professional development and TI technology and uh, content areas in the TI Research Library. Now, if you're looking for, example, the TI-84 color edition and its impact on the ACT, you may not find that specific because typically in that scenario, what they're looking at is how does graphing technology of any kind impact ACT scores? So then, so be, be aware of that when you're looking to, to not be super specific on something where there's multiple ways. Because, for example, TI is not the only uh, graphing calculator company in the world. So it wouldn't just be ours. And even from ours, we make many kinds. So you would want to look at the, the broader category to make sure that you're getting the best data. And then, of course, there are national organizations that uh, maintain different data, and a lot of foundations keep data. So we're going to actually look at some of these. Uh, so here's the Census Bureau. Now, at the Census Bureau, you can find uh, topics on population and economy, information about uh, geographical areas. Uh, you can find out uh, all types of information on publications that relate to things that are going on, to videos and photographs. And then there's data. There's tools for developers. Um, there's all sorts of data related to what's going on in different communities. There's survey and programs. Uh, for example, the 2010 census, you'll find a lot of uh, demographic data just in that alone. Uh, but this is a great place to go and look it up your community, find information, and be able to use that information uh, in your uh, proposal, in your statement of need. And it doesn't mean you have to pull out a 40-page research document and try to incorporate that whole thing in there. You're just pulling out the pieces related to what you're trying to do. Okay. Here's another site that you can go to. This is Federal Stats. And this one has um, all sorts of uh, statistical data, uh, resources and standards, data releases, different agencies, so there's a lot of information here um, related that they gather around the world. Uh, so statistical programs of the United States. So if you're looking for statistics on a particular type of program, this is a great source to find that information. Um, it's similar to the What Works Wearing House, only this one keeps a registry of different places that are gathering different uh, statistical data. 
So it's kind of like a, a warehouse site for where can I find uh, data. This is the What Works Clearinghouse. So when you're looking to find out um, research on different programs, products, practices, policies in education, this is a great place to find that information. So it's not only a great place to find a solution to a problem, it's also a great place to find research about that solution so that you have data that arms you, your response and why your solution or why your organization is the best at solving this particular problem or that the, the program that you want to implement is going to be the best solution to that problem or behaviors and other things that impact your problem, those constraints on what you're trying to do. Uh, the What Works Clearinghouse is a terrific resource for this. And I will tell you that for larger grants, many of them are looking at only funding things that have met the criteria to be listed in the What Works Clearinghouse. So if your school or district is looking to do a very large grant, you're going to want to start here in terms of thinking about what it is you want to do to solve that problem that you've identified. And you want to make sure that your solution your vision and your mission and your goal about how you're going to go about solving that problem is found in the What Works Clearinghouse. Okay. This is data that when I talked about going to like your State Department of Ed uh, and finding specific school data, in this case, I went to TEA and I pulled up the 2015-2016 school report card for Farmersville High School. So if you're working at you know Farmersville High School, uh, you'd be able to go and find out the total number of students, what grades it spans, the type of campus. It's going to have a performance index, uh, index and how they came about creating that. Uh, it's going to have your accountability rating, whether or not they met, did or didn't meet the standards. Uh, and then it's going to go into school and student information. It tells you at the campus what the attendance rate was, the district, the state. It's got your enrollment numbers. Uh, and this is comparative data. You know, your campus, in this case, this campus has 5.1 percent uh, African American students, whereas at the state, the, the average enrollment is 12.6%. So that's how you would present that data. You want to be comparative. Uh, if you were using a, a comparable district, you'd want to pull that school district's report card as well so that you could compare the two. Okay. Here you could even compare the campus to the, whole, to the district as a whole. Um, there's more data here. You know, you have your English and language arts, all your different subject matters, and how the students are doing um, class size-wise, or how many kids are economically disadvantaged, or English language learners, uh, all of which may impact your problem. They may be related to, maybe your kids are performing badly in class, in your math class, because they don't speak English, and they're still learning. So you want to do an English language immersion program to help your students succeed and then also provide them with tools uh, that will help them with the mathematic modeling and uh, graphing equations. And you need to teach your teachers strategies to work on helping students that are English language learners in their classroom. So there's a lot of different uh, things that you can pull just from a school report card or a district report card. It's also going to show what your school's already spending for students uh, and where, they're, where the percentage of that spending is going. So there's a lot of information here. Here's your testing data. So a school report card and a district report card are valuable tools whenever you're writing 
a, a grant proposal for a school or a district. I think this is my last data research area. Okay, so from TI we talked about the research library. Uh, we have research on teaching with graphing calculators. This is uh, generic uh, research. It's not tied to a particular product. Uh, there's research on teaching and learning with graphing calculators. This is uh, slightly different information. So this is effective teaching as opposed to the graphing technology itself. Uh, then there's research on using the graphing technology and what impact it has on learning concepts and things in the classroom. Uh, so we'll just look at Inspire here for a second. And then you'll notice we've got different breakdowns. So there's qualitative research versus quantitative, which is uh, uh, numer more numerical in, in its value. So here, this one's conclusion, teachers using Inspire will convince that, so you notice that this is, this is their input. Uh, it's more subjective. Um, and you might think that that subjective type of data, those surveys and opinions based on uh, other professionals in your field are less powerful, but they're actually not because every teacher in a classroom is a professional. Your experience in your classroom, your knowledge and your years in the profession carry weight. You didn't go through college and all those classes that you took to not have that professional background. So what you have to say and what you contribute when you're writing a grant proposal is valuable because it is coming from an expert. So remember that when you're looking at your data and you need to add that qualitative data. You know your students. No other teacher knows your students the way you do. You know how the kids, your target population, learn and how they're not learning. Because every day in the classroom, you are doing things to assist them in that learning, and you're gaining information back from them in the things where there's a gap between what you're teaching and what they know. And so you're identifying what, what that gap is, what's causing that gap. And so your opinion matters just as much as, uh, you know, a gold standard experimental research study performed by Dr. Smith from XYZ University. So remember that qualitative information. We do maintain some qualitative research. We also keep here, if you need, the research basis, meaning where did we begin, what, what was the foundation for what we were trying to do, we have a research basis. We also keep case studies where school districts, or uh, different organizations have engaged in a study related to a project or proposal that they were doing. And so that data is maintained here. And we also keep uh, experimental studies. Now there's gold standards, which would be research that's done by private entities. And then we have um, data that is conducted, of, obviously TI conducts research about our products. And then, so you would think that's, that carries a little bias. It doesn't really, but to somebody who's reading it, they may perceive that. So you want to be sure that your funder's good about the partners that you bring on board and where you're gathering your research from. But there's a lot of great research here in this research library. We go back. We also have research not just on the technology, uh, but on the professional development, you know, and on content areas and how to increase student success. So there's a lot of research here just on, on the TI side alone that can help you. But one of the other easy places to go and to find information is simply to go to Google and put in your type of problem. Just spell it out in Google and see what it pulls up. Back to our 
presentation here. So, so Jen, I'm gonna, if it's okay, to step in here just a second on, yes. on, on the research piece of it. A lot of times, um, a lot of times you will have additional kinds of of data that you can use. You know, when you state in a statement of need. And some of that can be even local information. I'm thinking about um, thinking about because we live in Texas. I'm thinking about all of the school districts and the needs they have had this year as a result of even um, the Hurricane Harvey and the devastation at those schools and um, the loss of equipment and the loss of even buildings and and so. You know, a lot of times in your statement of need, you can also add those local, uh, those local pieces of information. Uh, if if uh, if a community has a loss in revenue, uh, maybe you know a large technology plant moved away from there, or maybe uh, maybe there's been a downturn in the economy somehow, and people have lost jobs, and and uh, students you have more more students on free and reduced lunch, and you have you know, have less revenue coming in for taxes uh, in school districts. But you can also, statement of need can also add some of those things as well. And Jen is absolutely right on, on almost all of the grants that you will see now in education are going to want some research-based solutions that she has given you some really, really good uh, resources there to search for the some of the what other people have done and they've kept the records and they've kept the data and they've kept the statistics. So that is really a good idea for you to to you know to do a search through those and to find some of the solutions that meet the needs that you're trying to um, write a grant for. Um, because you and you and I love that question about how many pages or how much space will we have. You often don't have much. You don't have as much space to to cite as many things in a grant as you want to, and so you can make references to those, obviously, to those research sites where you found something that supports what you're saying. You know your solution, which and your outcomes might be, and so you don't you know don't think they're going to expect to see that whole research. Um, uh, Dialogue written there, but but do be able to reference those things when you cite some of it. That will help tremendously in any of your grants, even a small grant. It would help to to be able to go back and say, you know, this is the research basis for what we're proposing. Okay, thanks, Jan. Thank, thank you, Doris. That's that's exactly right. Uh, so, hot tip and a don't forget. Basically, you're going to find the most up to date and relevant information at, through a general search on a major search engine like Google. Um, that's going to pull up hundreds of local, regional, and national website links. Uh, a lot of times, the research that you need about your community is going to be right there done on your community's website, and you'll be able to find that data. And if you can't find it there, you can contact somebody at your um, community uh, center or the uh, your, your local government office, and they'll be able to direct you to the right person. Um, your school is going to have a lot of data already on your target population if you're coming from a school. Uh, essentially, though, the more information you have on this topic, the easier it's going to be to write that statement of need, no matter how many pages they give you. Okay, and I want to watch the time, make sure we have time, so we're going to hit this last little part, telling a compelling story. When you're doing your proposal and you're writing your statement of need, they have to be able to see your target population. So you want to include that anecdotal information to make your story real to the person who's doing the reviewing. If they can't see your kids, your kids aren't real to them, and it's easier to dismiss them. You've got to make the story real. So you need to paint a picture that speaks to the heart of what it is you're trying to do without the emotional appeal it needs to really make your kids real without going, oh, please, please. I mean, think about it. We all watch those commercials that are very sad, you know, give to whatever, and everybody changes the channel. So you don't want to go the emotional appeal, but you want to make your kids so real they can't turn away from them. So you've got to make sure that you do that. You need to use the data to support the 
that. The data is, is there not to be the story, but to support the story, because all grant stories are about a target population, and because it's about a target population, it's a human story. So remember to keep that human element in there through anecdotes. Uh, if you have the space, pictures. And don't forget, lastly, create a sense of urgency. You want to light a fire under them to make them want to support what you're trying to do. So uh, here I have mine and Doris's contact information, and the Dropbox links is there. Um, Michael should also be able to send that to you, but if you at least get mine or Doris's email address, we can also send you the Dropbox link where you'll be able to find uh, this PowerPoint, the resources from the other one, the list of links, uh, and all of that information. And before I give it over to Michael, I just wanted to say, uh, in February, I believe it's the 9th, we're doing a Creating a Sound Budget, uh, which is the, another comp key component to a successful grant proposal. And then, of course, uh, if you have the opportunity to come to the T3 International Conference, in San Antonio, please do. We're going to be doing a, a full day on grant writing where by the end of the day, you should leave with some parts of these either mapped out or the writing process itself uh, will begin. If you've got a team of people, bring that team that could come and help and, and begin the process of writing a successful grant. So I want to thank you, everybody. And I'm going to hand it back over to the mic. Yeah, thanks, thanks to all of you. Thanks, Jen. Good job. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jen and Doris. Um, as we begin to wrap things up here, uh, if you do have any last-minute questions, please try to get those asked. I know Doris and Jen are going to do their best to get those questions answered. Um, I do want to share on our website, education.ti.com, where you can get some information about part one of this uh, grant writing series. Again, it's a three-part series, as Jen had just mentioned. And again, visit our, our website, education.ti.com, and the middle tab is professional development, and slide down to free online learning. And then you can scroll down. Uh, you'll be able to register for the upcoming, it's February 8th. Jen, I just double-checked. Uh, part three webinars on, again, a Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern time, same start as this time, as uh, this webinar. Um, you'll be able to register for that in the next uh, week or two, should be available for registration. And if you missed part one or want to watch it again, you can go on to our on-demand. And all I did was I just selected a topic and moved down to grant writing. And the December 12th was part one. And so you can download the materials and view that recording at your own pace. So please feel free to visit our website to learn more. As Jen mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, the conference is a great place for a lot of things. For instance, like attending a uh, one-day grant writing uh, seminar. Um, it's also great just to meet people and, and connect with other educators that are like-minded. So we really hope that you'll be joining us at the T-Cubed International Conference this year it is in San Antonio coming up in early March. Earlier we mentioned that uh, by registering for tonight and attending, you're automatically entered for uh, a conference registration for two. And tonight's lucky winner is Kyle Lee Early. So Kyle, congratulations. We'll be in touch over email in the next couple of days to give you a little more information. But we hope to see Kyle as well as everyone else at the T-Cubed International Conference. To receive a certificate of attendance, go ahead and click that link in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents that we use tonight. If either of those links aren't working for any reason, don't worry, you'll automatically get a follow-up email within a couple days, and that follow-up email will contain a link to the recording, a link to the documents, as well as a link to the certificate. And if you're watching this on demand, 
go ahead and copy that link down to your favorite browser to receive your certificate. Thanks so much, Jen and Doris, for everything you shared tonight. Um, I thought part two was a, a great continuation to what you had talked about in part one. And uh, I'm looking forward to the February 8th, part three. Again, thanks so much for sharing everything you did tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thanks, Good night, everyone. everyone. Have a great night.